miss service this Sunday? You can watch any Sunday traditional service on our YouTube page. Just search FUMC Starkville. The book of Genesis tells us that God created the heavens and the earth and everything that lives upon the face of the earth. In the book of Genesis, chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, we find, And God said, Let the waters of the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every, of every kind, bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. As we continue in the book of Genesis, we'll find in Genesis chapter 1, verse 24, that God creates all animal life, everything that swims in the sea, everything that flies above the earth, and everything that walks or crawls or creeps upon the face of the earth. And then when we get to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God creates humankind. We'll read that in just a second, but I want you to be on the lookout for a word, dominion. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, and over all of the cattle and all the wild animals of the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in His image. In the image of God, He created them, male and female, He created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So we humans were created in the image of God, and we were given dominion over the rest of the earth. The word dominion is a word we don't use much anymore, but it's a word that designates power. It's a translation of the word from Hebrew to rule. And so dominion would be an aspect of power and authority. So for example, kings have dominion over their subjects. Teachers have dominion over their students. Uh, parents have dominion over their children. To have dominion is to have power and authority. And when God created humans, God said that humans were to have dominion or rule or power and authority over the plant life of the earth and the animal life of the earth. But power can be used for good or for evil. And as Christians, if we want to know how to use power wisely, we need to look to Jesus. There's a story in the Gospels where the disciples are arguing and competing with each other for power. They were kind of um, trying to get power and authority over each other. It comes to us in the Gospel of Mark chapter 10. Jesus knew the disciples were doing this, and he received it as a teachable moment. So if you've got your Bible, I encourage you to turn to Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 42. Jesus said to his disciples, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus gathers around the disciples and uses this teachable moment to lift up a negative example of power. He says, you all know how the Gentiles use power. They lord it over each other and become tyrants. And we could take a lot of time to define the word Gentile, but in this context, it's really functioning something like for us, how we would kind of say worldly or worldly minded or secular. Jesus kind of says, you know how worldly people use power? They lord it over each other and they become tyrants. But then Jesus says, not so among you. Jesus wants his followers to use power in a different way. He doesn't want them to use it in a worldly sense as, a, as an attempt to gain power and authority over others. Rather, he wants them to follow his example and to use power and authority for the sake of others. 
This way of using power, to use power for the sake of others, is very much in keeping with the life and teachings of Jesus. In fact, it's more than just a teaching of Jesus, it's the pattern of his entire life. Jesus used his power and authority for us and for our salvation. And so he taught his followers to do the same, that we might use our power, not lord it over each other and not become tyrants, but that we would use our power for the sake of others, especially those who are in need. And I think at some level we understand this, that, that power and responsibility and authority is meant to be for the sake of care, not for the sake of abuse. For example, when a child gets a puppy, the parents will all, you know, how, you know how this works, the child will beg for a puppy and beg for a puppy and beg for a puppy and the parents say, no, no, no. Finally, the parents will say, okay, you can get a puppy, but you are going to have to be responsible. It is your puppy. You're going to have to feed the puppy, and care for the puppy, and you're going to have to take responsibility for this puppy. Now, that's kind of how it normally works, but can you imagine a situation where the parent said, okay, we'll give you a puppy, but you're going to have authority, dominion over this puppy. So if you want to feed it, feed it. If you want to starve it, starve it. It's your puppy. If you want to pet it, great. If you want to kick it in the head, kick it in the head. You have power and authority over this puppy. We, your parents, we don't want to get involved. It's your puppy. You just do with it whatever you want to. Now, I think for most of us, if we heard a parent telling that to a child, we would try to, I don't know, call 911 and tell them something bad or try to move out of the neighborhood. I don't know. It'd be kind of scary, right? Because we understand that responsibility and authority and power, that's meant to be used for the sake of the animal, not against the animal. And if the child were to take the authority given and use it to abuse the animal, we would know that's, that's not really what is intended. But sadly, that is how many of us have interpreted the words from Genesis, that humans are given dominion over plant and animal life. In many cases, humans have received that authority and used it as an excuse to do with plants and animals whatever we want to, forgetting that God gave us dominion for the sake of all of the earth, and that if we are to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, all power and authority is to be used for the sake of others, especially the weakest and most vulnerable among us. And when we use our power and our authority to care for others, to lift them up, to guard those who are vulnerable, we are following in the footsteps of Jesus and growing His disciples. So I hope you'll hear this today, that you have power and authority to care for the resources of the earth, the plants of the earth, and the animals of the earth. And when you care for them, you're following in the footsteps of Christ and imitating the one who said, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Join us Sunday morning at 11 a.m. for our traditional service. I am no longer my own, but thine. Hey, brother, why so quiet? That's so last century or three. Nowadays, we party for New Year's Eve. And that is precisely why I am being quiet. This is the perfect time to write down our bad habits and recommit to God. It is a watch night. Oh, already there. No. It has everything to do with what our Moravian brethren showed us long ago. Instead of welcoming another year with wild revelry, we Christians can choose to renew our covenant with our Lord and try to do better. Okay, I'm in. What's the plan? I'm just writing down some notes about bad choices I want to leave behind me. And then I'm heading over to church to join the others to sing and pray as the year winds down. Join me? Hmm, how long will they be there? It might take me a bit to do my list. Sometimes they burn the notes at the end. I'll hurry. Oh. I hate to miss a good fire. Join us Sunday morning at 8.40 a.m. for our traditional service. And we're back. Earlier we talked about creation care and how God has given humans dominion over the plants and the animals of the earth. And we discussed how dominion is power and authority, but it's power and authority that is meant to be used for the good of all of creation. Now a lot of times when we have animals in our homes that we think of as pests, the way we handle that is we just kill them. But that's not really a good way of practicing the stewardship that God has given us. That's not really a great way to use the power that we have for the sake of animals. And so 
Today I'd like to show you a, a creation care way of dealing with pests in the home, a, a positive loving way of dealing with animals that get into your home that you may not really want there. So in order to do that, I've invited our exotic animal expert, Bill Green, and he has brought with him a guest. So Bill, who have you got here? I've got my uh, pet spider, it's called a Bavarian uh, carpet spider. A Bavarian carpet spider. I have yes. never seen a Bavarian carpet spider. They are rare. Um, okay. Particularly in the United States. But okay. uh, I brought one over here. Wow. Uh, it does not need to get out of this cage. Okay. Uh, well, that's one, that's one of the things we're going to do. Now, so is it, is it aggressive all the time? Only if it feels threatened. Okay. Then that'll be great because yes. uh, what, what I want to do is show these good folks how to, how to deal with a spider like this in their home in a non-aggressive or non-threatening way. So I think actually we'll probably be fine. Because I'm not going to... As long as it's there, uh, und undisturbed, we're okay. Yeah, we're not going to do anything to... Does it have a name? Bavarian. Bavarian. We're not going to do anything to Bavarian to stir him up. I'm just going to show you folks um, how we want to... If you have a spider like this in your home, how you want to capture the spider. Not kill the spider, but capture and release the spider. So in just a second, we're going to... Um, we're going to have to let him out of this just so I can show them how yep, to get him back he'd in. He'd like to look around. Okay, but... As he's not threatened. I, I won't do anything threatening. Okay. All right. Well, we'll get everything set up with Bavarian here, and we'll be right back. Okay. Join us Sunday morning at 11 a.m. for our traditional service. All right, everybody. Thank you, Bill, for helping us here with Bavarian. So Bavarian is out, and what we want to try to do is is I want to try to show you a non-violent, non-aggressive way to deal with pests in your home. So what you're going to need is a, a cup. Usually something uh, a, like a nukes cup is fine, but um, Bavarian's a pretty, pretty serious spider here. So we're going to use a country crock bucket here, and then you're going to need a sheet of paper. This sheet of paper might be a little flimsy, but uh, we'll just kind of have to feel it out. You know, if you've got a cardstock paper, that's even better. But what we're going to try to do is come up on Bavarian really carefully and, and kindly, and we're going to place the bucket over him. Then we're going to slide the paper under. Then we have him just like this, and we can carry him outside and set him free. Or in this case, we'll put him back in his, uh, his uh, thing that Bill brought, the cage or whatever. But So that's what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to do that very calmly and non-aggressively. Okay? And one thing that I like to do, uh, because we are all brothers and sisters in creation as created beings. So one thing that I really like to do is just try to talk to the animal as I approach it in a calm and soothing voice. All right? So let's try to do that now. Hey, Brother Bavarian. Hey, Brother Spider. Here we go. Just want to get you right here. Here we go. Just going to try to get... Ah! It's on me! It's on me! Get it off of me! Sweet Lord! Help! Back. All right, people. All right, people. We're back. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Just want to close this out by telling you, you know, if you have a spider like this in your house, the main things you just want to do is just want to real calm, get your shoe off, and come over and just be like, "Duh!" Join us Sunday morning at 11 a.m. for our traditional service.
This video was brought to you by the people of the United Methodist Church through world service donations. Did you miss service this Sunday? You can watch any Sunday traditional service on our YouTube page. Just search FUMC Starkville. The first image of God we get in the Bible is God as a gardener. In Genesis chapter 1, God is fashioning the earth and the trees and placing the sun and the moon and the stars in the sky. And then in Genesis chapter 2, we get this incredible description of who God is and what God does. Genesis 2 says, Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. This passage portrays God as one who reaches down into the dirt and shapes and molds the soil, bringing forth new life, the life of the human being, and then breathing the breath of God, the life of God, into that human being. And isn't that what gardeners do? Gardeners don't grow humans, of course, but they do care for and nurture and tend the soil so that the soil can bring forth new life. So one of the very first images we get in Scripture is God as a gardener. Think about some of the gardeners you know, and think about some of the habits and virtues that they possess. Gardeners have to be attentive to care for the plants, and, and they have to be patient because growth takes time. Gardeners have to be generous with their time and energy, committing themselves to nurturing and caring for the plant and for the seed and for the soil so that it can bring forth new life. And God is all of those things and more with us. God is attentive to our needs. God is patient with us in our failures, and God is generous to us. So one of the very first images we see of God in all of Scripture is God the gardener. But God the gardener doesn't stop in Genesis. So I encourage you this week, get out your Bibles and see if you can find other places in Scripture where God is portrayed as a gardener. And that's this week's Image of God. Did you miss service this Sunday? You can watch any Sunday traditional service on our YouTube page. Just search F-U-M-C Starkville. If you're going to be a Methodist, you should understand who you are and why you are. You come here and you realize that this was not a denomination of convenience. That this is a denomination that was founded out of a profound need to serve people who are not being served, people who are not having the sacraments, people that were not hearing the gospel, people that were not being ministered to. And out of that need and out of that great desire, this church was formed. Lovely Lane in Baltimore could be called the Mother Church of American Methodism. The original meeting house was the site of the 1784 Christmas Conference, which formed the Methodist Episcopal Church. The Reverend Patricia Sebring is the current pastor. It was here that Asbury was ordained and it was here that he served as a preacher. Your feet are truly on holy ground. Your eyes look upward and you see amazing things. The stained glass windows list the names of pastors going back to 1773. Francis Asbury, Robert Strawbridge, a reminder of the everyday people who laid the cornerstone and dedicated their lives to the denomination. The Romanesque revival style church you see today was built to mark the centennial of the Christmas conference, says historian John Strawbridge. And it was also built at a time when we were not together as a denomination, when we were, we were divided into the Methodist Protestants, the Methodist Episcopal, the Methodist Episcopal South. Uh, and so it was an opportunity to remind these offshoots of our common heritage as, as Methodists and as Christians and to begin to bring the denomination back together. Construction also came at a time when membership was down to just a hundred people. The Sunday school had closed. It meets a lot of resistance. It's too big, it's too expensive, it's outside the city. And it really takes a lot of vision for a struggling congregation to say, let's build a thousand seat monumental building. It's really a wonderful testament of faith. The sanctuary looks as it did in 1887. None of the thousand seats is more than 53 feet from the pulpit. The painted sky dome is a favorite feature, a starscape of the nighttime sky, with the constellations and planets in the exact positions they would have appeared from this spot the day the building was dedicated. The 185-foot tower atop the church is illuminated at night 
the upper four stories form a cross, a beacon. If you ask people about Lovely Lane, they might say, which church is that again? And say, you know the big lighted cross? Oh, I know that church. I see that from the expressway. I see that from my home. The basement is filled with centuries of church history. A tour is available every Sunday after worship, but members want to ensure that Lovely Lane is known as more than a museum. It is a place where history is alive and waiting for United Methodists to write the next chapter. To see people get excited and get energized about church and about the denomination is, is really is just a wonderful thing. And to see people begin to internalize that and almost to have the Wesleyan moment where he said, I felt my heart strangely warmed. It really is the roots of United Methodism is that it's, it is a church about people, not a church about a church. This video was brought to you by the people of the United Methodist Church. Join us Sunday morning at 8.40 a.m. for our traditional service. Hey, welcome back to a little segment we like to call Hymns of the Faith. Our hymn today is hymn number 97 in your United Methodist hymnal, For the Fruits of This Creation. If you've got a hymnal, I invite you to turn to page 97. If you don't, you can look it up on the internet. But before we start singing, I do want to direct your attention to verse 2. Verse 2 says, In the help we give our neighbor, God's will is done. In our worldwide task of caring for the hungry and despairing, future needs and sin. You better do that again, Jay. <laughs> Gosh, that's not the right verse. Okay, back up. Here we go. Hello, and welcome back to another segment we love to call Hymns of the Faith. Our hymn today is hymn number 97 in your United Methodist hymnal for the fruits of this creation. If you have a hymnal, I invite you to turn to page 97. If you don't, you can look it up on the internet. But before we start singing, I do want to direct your attention to verse 2. Verse 2 says, In the just reward of God's labor, God's will is done. In the help we give our neighbor, God's will is done. In our worldwide task of caring for the hungry and despairing, in the harvests we are sharing, God's will is done. Earlier we spoke about Christian responsibility to care for creation, which includes plant and animal life. When we read something like verse 2, in our worldwide task for caring of the hungry and despairing, we may jump immediately to thinking of our task of caring for other humans. But we do also have a responsibility to care for plant life and animal life and the earth itself. So as we sing this, I encourage you to be mindful of all of the ways that we can connect this hymn to our faith. All right, for the fruits of this creation. For the fruits of this creation, thanks be to God, God, for God's gift to every nation. Thanks be to God for the plowing, sowing, reaping, silent growth while we are sleeping, future needs in earth safekeeping. Thanks be to God in the just reward of labor. God's will is done, done in the help we give our neighbor. God's will is done in our worldwide task of caring for the hungry and despairing. In the harvest we are sharing, God's will is done. For the harvest of the Spirit, thanks be to God. For the good we all inherit, thanks be to God. For the wonders that astound, for the truth that still confound, most of all that love has found. Thanks be to God.
Thank you all so much for being with us as we celebrate this hymn of our faith. The end.